In today's lesson, we're looking at Hooke's Law, the first of the materials lessons. And some of this you may have done at GCSE already. It doesn't really go much beyond GCSE, except for in thinking about what we need this information for. So in all kinds of engineering design, so if you have plans to be a structural engineer of any kind or an architect, the strength and stiffness of a material is really important because it dictates how they respond to forces and therefore what you can build with them. And we're going to be talking about both tensile and compressive forces here. Tensile forces are those that are stretching or pulling forces. And compressive forces are squashing or pushing down forces. This graph that you see here is the classic GCSE Hooke's Law graph, where force in newtons is plotted against extension, which we give the symbol delta x, and that's in meters, or indeed you see it in centimeters or millimeters, just be careful about that. And you get a straight line that runs through the origin, and that is what Hooke's Law is. And on the right here you can see the classic experiment. I will put a link to the FET simulations in the description box, and I'll put a little link here so that you can follow it. Um, they have an excellent simulation of Hooke's Law for springs in both series and in parallel, and it's worth checking out if you want to do a little virtual experiment on this. So this is the idea with Hooke's Law. You hang weights from a spring, and the weight is equal to the pull force of the spring, or the tensile force of the spring. Now strictly, and sometimes you see this, this graph should be drawn the other way around, where force is your independent variable and extension is your dependent variable. And that's because we're changing the force with which the spring pulls back. And so by adding weights on, we cause the spring to pull back with an equal and opposite force. And that's what we're actually changing. And then we're measuring the extension that goes along with it. That bears noting, too, that it is extension that we're measuring. You do see graphs where they have force against length of spring, and those will be straight lines, but they will not go through the origin. Depending on which axis is which, you will have an intercept, so that is something to watch out for. Now, of course, if we have a straight line through the origin, and we'll use this first graph, that means that F is proportional to the extension, the change in the length of the spring. And the constant of proportionality here is given a k. And that's a constant known as the spring constant. What our specification ref refers to as the stiffness of the spring. So just be aware that those, that is the word they actually use for it. And therefore, f is equal to k delta x. And that's our equation for Hooke's Law. You should be aware that Hooke's Law is used for objects classically, we use springs to demonstrate it because springs are the classic elastic objects. It's fairly straightforward to hang masses off them, measure their extension. But of course, this applies to any object. So it's an object of specific dimensions and of a specific spring constant. The other thing that you need to be aware of is the parallel and series springs. So when you add two springs in parallel, their k is multiplied by 2. In other words, they become stiffer. Their extension becomes half as much for the same force. If you add three springs in parallel, you get three times the stiffness, the spring constant, and so on. In series, it's the opposite. Your spring constant is divided by 2. That means you get half the stiffness and twice the extension for the same amount of force, and with the same pattern with 3, with three springs in series, it's k divided by three, etc. Let's not forget about compression in this, and we often do when we talk about the Hooke's Law, because we don't often do the opposite side, the compression of a spring with force. And this graph shows this rather nicely. You can see this was the original Hooke's Law graph that we had above. You get the same idea, of course, when you compress a spring. So you could pile weights on top of the spring and see how much it compresses. You will get to a maximum compression, which is the fundamental um, length of the spring. And this is, is demonstrated rather nicely here, where this is the equilibrium length of the spring, the third one down. 
and you can compress or you can extend, but it is a linear graph up to certain limits. And we're going to get to those limits now. On compression, the limit is the fundamental length of the spring, unless you exert a very large force on it. But on extension, it's slightly different. So again, starting with a fairly basic looking graph, we have to be able to identify the parts of this graph. And so you can see, while we have this straight line section here up to about here, we know that f is equal to k delta x. And remembering that f being equal to k delta x is Hooke's law, this is the part, while it remains a straight line, that the spring is obeying Hooke's law. The point where it stops being a straight line is called the limit of proportionality. In other words, the line is no longer straight, the relationship is no longer proportional. Somewhere above that, we will have a point called the elastic limit. Now, people sometimes confuse these two points. The elastic limit is the point beyond which the, the object is no longer elastic. And what elastic means, or elastic behavior, is that if you take the force away, the object will return to its original shape. So anywhere beyond the elastic limit, when you take the force off, let's take the example of the spring, it will not return to its original length. Now between the elastic limit and the limit of proportionality, even though we no longer have a proportional relationship, it is still exhibiting elastic behavior, and so if you take the force off, it will go back to its original length. After our elastic limit, we say that our spring or object is displaying plastic deformation or plastic behavior. And this is the point where it is permanently deformed. It doesn't go back to its original shape. Now, plastic behavior, we will look at in more detail when we do stress strain graphs, which is the next level up. But with plastic behavior, you can get very large extensions. As you can see, the line goes more horizontal. You can get very large extensions for small amounts of force. You can even get extensions if you remove force. But again, we will come back to this that in another video on stress strain graphs. And of course, finally, you have your fracture where the spring actually just breaks. Let's look for a moment at what the area under this graph gives us. And we'll do it for both the linear region and the nonlinear region. So here in the linear region, we know that the area is going to be half the base times the height. That means that our area is half the force times the extension. Now the extension here is the distance that is moved in the direction of the force. The area here is giving you the energy stored in the spring. Meaning that energy stored is equal to half F delta X. And that's normally given a little subscript of EL so that you know it's elastic potential energy. Now why the half? Well, the half is there because we don't have a constant amount of force. Our force is increasing. And so we have a force of zero down here at the bottom, and we have our maximum force while it is linear up there at the limit of proportionality. And so that half represents the average between that maximum force and zero. What about in the region where it's not linear? Well, the area under the graph is still going to give you the energy stored by the spring. But in this case, of course, it's not quite so easy to calculate. And the expectation here is that you find the area by either counting squares or dividing it into rectangles and triangles and doing your best estimation. So if we want to calculate the energy stored by a spring, we can calculate it using half fx. Of course, we know that f is equal to k delta x, so we can substitute k delta x in for f in this equation, giving us a second expression for the elastic potential energy, which would be half k delta x squared. This final graph here is a nice illustration of the sort of thing you can get once you go beyond the basic GCSE level Hooke's law. And of course, if you'll notice on this one, they use delta L for the extension of the spring, whereas our specification uses delta X. You can see this is our part where Hooke's law is obeyed and it's proportional. There is our limit of proportionality. It labels the entire section here 
as the elastic region, meaning that will be our elastic limit. We then go into a, a place of permanent deformation, otherwise known as plastic deformation, until, and you see the size of the extensions that you get, until you get fracture. So you'll see that this graph is in the opposite direction to the previous one that we saw, where it tended to flatten off because extension was on the x-axis. When extension is on the y-axis, it gets steeper because you're getting larger extensions for smaller amounts of force on the x. The very last graph before I go is one I want to remark on. This is that for an elastic band, which exhibits a slightly strange behavior. So what we're seeing here is the force extension graph. Obviously, it should start in the corner, it's just a little off. It's difficult to see from this graph, it may obey Hooke's law, there may be some straight line part. The most important thing here is to look at the difference between the loading graph, that is as you add forces to the elastic band, and the unloading graph as you take them off. Now this is not passing its elastic limit or anything like that, but you'll notice that you have this space in the center. And if we think about what the area under the graph represents for a force extension graph, we know that it's the energy stored by the elastic band. And so what this is telling us is unloading the energy that you give the elastic band by loading it is greater than the energy that it gives back on unloading. This orange part in the center is the energy that the elastic band has kept, if you like. It's the difference between the energy unloading and on unloading. And this is what happens with rubber when you repeatedly stretch it, like for example when you warm up a squash ball. This is what you're doing. You're causing it compression and tension, causing it to stretch and unstretch, and that missing energy is held onto the ball as heat. And this is a phenomenon called hysteresis.